This is the last DB2 uh, session at GSC 2021. So thanks for joining us. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Chris Crane to you from Broadcom. I almost said IBM. Uh, it's a little while since you've been at IBM, but you were there for 30 years in the DB2 Vizos development team. So extensive knowledge of DB2. And uh, I've been to so many sessions by you that um, got loads of notes. And this is uh, the DB2 for ZOS continuous delivery five years on or five years later. So um, if you've got any questions, pop them in the chat uh, on the screen or raise your hand if you want me to unmute you and you can ask the question. We try and take questions as we go along uh, or at the end, see how they go, see how it goes. Um, this session is for BI. Do remember to do the feedback at the end. We have two charities we're supporting here at GSE. So I'll give you a final call for that. Please contribute to the RNLI and Guide Dogs for the Blind charities. They do great work and we're hoping to give them a nice uh, amount of money at the end of this uh, week. So thanks very much everyone for joining. This is the last GSE session this year. I'm passing over to Chris Crone for continuous delivery. All right, thank, thank you very much for the, uh, the nice introduction. I was, I was gonna joke that you're saving the best for last, but uh, <laughs> anyway, all right. Um, happy to be here with you guys, although I, I will say that, uh, that I, uh, I would much rather uh, start to be in person, I think. Uh, um, but I do appreciate you, you, you coming out and, and listening. Um, and as Colin mentioned, please feel free to uh, put questions in the chat and I'll answer as we go along. So let's jump right in. Um, here's the uh, information on the charities. So make sure that uh, you take a look at that. I don't believe there's anything in here that is certainly Broadcom um, forward, forward looking, but anyway, we were required to put that in. So. What are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about the, the DB2 continuous delivery overview. And this is just kind of a, um, a very brief overview about how it, how it works. Uh, I'm sure most of you have got you know, a, quite a bit of knowledge in this space, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time there. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of vendors, um, Broadcom being one, but the other one being SAP and, and how they're adapting. Uh, and then we'll talk uh, talk about what what actually was delivered in continuous delivery, and, and what maybe you need to be aware of as you as you move forward. Um, and also, you know, maybe some things that, that if even if, even if you have adopted a function level above five hundred, maybe you missed something. So we'll talk about that, and then we'll talk about how how people feel about it. I think so. Get into that. Um, so I will say that uh, that I did this presentation and it was all finished and I realized that it looked very boring. So I went back and, and put some gratuitous uh, uh, animation, et cetera, in here. So uh, um, I hope you at least appreciate the, uh, the, the animation because otherwise this chart would have just had like, you know, four words on it in, in blue ink or something. So, all right. So if you look at DB2 from a, from a perspective of, of, you know, releases, um, we were on a, when I was working at IBM, we were on a kind of a three-year release cycle. Every three years, we were doing something. And as, as uh, 2015 rolled around and the early ship program started, there was this feeling of, you know, something needs to be different because of the way the industry had changed. Cloud computing had come on very strong in, in the version 11 timeframe. Um, DB2 had been doing agile programming. Uh, of course, DB2 had been delivering things in, in the service stream for years, uh, you know, things like in version 11, the REST APIs, as an example, went out. But there wasn't really the capability to deliver something that was, uh, I'll call it disruptive. So, so a change that maybe changed the behavior of the system, or uh, if you would call it a catalog change. And there's lots of things that, that went out, um, real-time statistics, as an example, went out, where the catalog uh, tables were not in uh, the, the DSM DB06 as an example. And then as migration to the next release, they were either created or migrating into DSM DB06. So there was a lot of, of uh, issues that prevented DB2 from really um, moving forward in a continuous model. And, and so we looked at, to address those things um, literally after we went to the early ship customers. So we had basically, I'm going to say six to eight months to put the infrastructure in for continuous delivery. 
And to do that, you had to basically look and say, well, what is it that we had you know, that we could leverage? And so we had Apple Compat, that was a version 11 item. And we had uh, the, the modes, right? We had, if you remember back to version 11, it's been a while, but we had uh, conversion mode, uh, new function mode, right? Um, and then we had the star modes. So if I went to new function mode and I fell back, I was in CM star as an example. So, you know, those, that infrastructure was there since version eight uh, and, and Apple Compat, like I said, since version 11. So we, we basically put those things together and then went on literally on a road show where we went out and started talking to customers about what do you think about this? Does this make sense? Um, what is it that you need to feel comfortable to, to allow us to, to use this mechanism to, you know, uh, make changes in your system as, as we went through without, without a release change? And so we came up with, with several concepts that I'm sure you're, you're kind of aware of, so we'll go through them really quick. But the first one is the maintenance level. And, and obviously, people always have been putting maintenance on DB2, but they typically talked about things like RSU levels. So I, I'm at RSU, whatever, or I'm at put level, you know, 90, 90.02 or something. Uh, but the maintenance level really talks about capability. And so what it does is as you apply maintenance normally, uh, things that, that could be exploited are applied to your system. Okay, so just going out through the normal maintenance, there's things like uh, um, new enhancements that don't require function levels, and then there's new enhancements that do require new function level or Apple Compat. And then there's catalog level. And like I mentioned, you'd never really, prior to version, uh, version 12, there was no way with once the, the product was shipped, to, to change the catalog. It was just too dis considered too disruptive. So there's the catalog level, which reflects um, incremental changes in the catalog during the release. And then function levels essentially do two things. They control new behavior. So things that aren't uh, SQL related. So maybe uh, new capabilities. I'll, I'll talk about start ML as an example as a new capability that was enabled by a, a function level. And then it also enables the application compatibility to be advanced to, to take advantage of those things. And once you've activated a function level, the important thing to remember is that you can't back the maintenance off. You can go back to a star mode, but you can't back the maintenance off that supports that. And then Apple Compat, like I said, was a carryover from version 11, and it was really intended to help customers deal with, um, I'll call it the fallout, uh, some of which I'm sure that I was responsible for of, of version 10, where um, there were a number of changes made that, that really put customers in a tight spot. The, the one that comes to mind, probably your mind also, is uh, the, uh, the change to the decimal function. So if you do char of a decimal, uh, you received uh, either, either had leading zeros or didn't have leading zeros. And, and the problem really was um, that the, the DB2 behavior was not compatible with the DB2 family or with the SQL standard. And so it was felt that, you know, that was probably something that weren't, a lot of people weren't doing and we should make that change because we, we, at that point, we were engaging with customers who were bringing on new applications and they were complaining about the behavior. But the problem was making that change on a, on a release boundary actually made it so that if you were in data sharing, as an example, and you had one member that was version nine and one member, member that was version 10, you, you basically had to have uh, uh, two versions of the application up and running. And, you know, it's not practical, right? There, there's just not the ability to, um, to, to make all those changes at the same time that a, a release is rolling in and things. So uh, as a result of that, the feedback from the customers um, was that they didn't want that, those sorts of changes to occur. And Apple Compat uh, was born. And I, I will just say that when we, when we shopped Apple Compat around to customers in terms of, you know, what do you think of this? Is this gonna solve your problems? We got kind of two things. One is, uh, yeah, that'll solve our, our problem. And then when we said, well, you do realize this is a tax on the DBA, right? That you need to, you need to control this parameter now. And, you need to advance it when, when it needs to be advanced and things like that. We sort of got this, yeah, okay, that seems okay. That's, that's, a, that's a worthy trade-off. But um, I, I think it's turned out to be quite a bit of a, uh, um, of, a of a large tax on, on the DBA community. And as such, what you tend to see is you tend to see a lot of applications 
with uh, V10R1 or V11R1, even you know five plus years into VD212. So, um, just kind of the basic assumptions at the time that this was done and they've kind of been fulfilled is that there would be you know maintenance levels is, that are normal. Function levels would come out three to four times a year. Um, we would continue, and, 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 and DB2 did continue to ship function that, that, that doesn't affect, uh, you know, applications or is, um, is something that, that can be shipped without, uh, without requiring um, an application to change. Those things don't go out with a function level uh, and an Apple Compat level. And then the occasional incompatible change or, or, or new enhancement for, for SQL and, D, and DDL, which DDL is new in DB212, um, can be filtered out with Apple Compat in the sense that I can run an application you know, with an older Apple Compat to get the previous behavior. So just a, a quick run through of, of what's going on in DB2. So normally you've got, uh, in this case, I've got three data sharing groups um, across four LPARs. Um, and I'm going to install new maintenance. And as I roll in the new maintenance across the system, um, I can now do things like for DG3, I can do the cat mate that may or may not be required to, to move that system forward. And then I could activate a new function level um, if, if, uh, if I felt like it. And then as I rolled out maintenance across the rest of the systems, um, I could control the, the cat mates on those systems and the, the functionality uh, for new function level. At, you know, individually by by uh, by a data sharing group. So things like like a a change to the the cat main is obviously a, a a data sharing group level function, as well as is a, a as an activation of a new function level. Um, and and the feeling was that that customers most customers would say you put put maintenance on twice a year. So you would put maintenance on, and let's say it includes a uh, function level five hundred two. And then six months later, you put maintenance on and includes level function level 503. If you went to go activate a function level, you wouldn't activate 503, you would activate 502. This would still give you the opportunity, if, if necessary, to back off maintenance for um, 503 if you had a bad experience with, with a piece of maintenance or something. Something was PE'd or, or some other issue occurred that, that caused your system some, some consternation. Um, and then after you've stabilized on a function level, um, and, and what I mean by that is you run, for, run at that function level for a little while, you're pretty sure you're not going to go back to star mode. Um, you would activate Apple Compat if necessary for applications that wanted to exploit that functionality. And we'll talk about some examples of that. And you know, to help customers with, uh, with you know, what's going on in their system, we modified display group to give you some additional information. Um, the DB2 level there shows that, uh, that the highest function level for the system is 509. So the, so the maintenance level on the system is, is fairly high. But you can see that the catalog level and the, the activated function levels are, are, are still pretty low on this particular system. There's also a, a, a table called syslevel updates that, that provides information about um, when certain things happen. So when uh, uh, a function level was, was activated, when a cat mate was done, um, if you go back into star mode, that's recorded here. Uh, there is something strange about this table, and I don't know whether anyone's going to be, um, I would say certainly in California time, which it's uh, just about 7.45 a.m., you probably wouldn't be sharp enough to, to, to pick up uh, uh, what's, what's, uh, what's wrong in this picture, if you will. But uh, anyone's uh, got a guess, I'll give you a second here to, to type it in or raise your hand. All right, I'm a next next guess. So now looking at it, does anyone have a guess? I'm gonna sip a coffee. All right, in the interest of time, we'll just move on. Um, DB212 didn't GA until October of 2016. So if you notice, this is August of 2016. So obviously, this machine was a, a, a was an ESP machine. Some this is actually a Broadcom machine. That I ran this on, but obviously this was installed prior to GA, and um, and, and that's why those dates precede the, uh, the the GA of the product. All right, so um, just a little bit of information about vendors. Uh, as many of you probably know, I, I worked extensively with SAP over the years, and and I'm still friends with a number of those folks, and so. 
I asked and they offered a, a couple slides for me to, uh, to put into this presentation, just so you can kind of see how, how they as a vendor is, is approaching, um, you know, continuous delivery. <clears throat> and they, they kind of looked at it and they, they plotted it at here as, a, as a, an X and Y axis, right? Um, and if you think about maintenance, that's just a function of time. I'm applying maintenance like I've always applied maintenance. And then um, as you look at the, the Y axis, it's function. And it's, it's really a question about when you um, want to apply function. And so what SAP does is, is they basically start applying maintenance and running regression. And then as the regression is, is running and completing, they basically do a, a function level certification. And then um, that's that, those two first two things, the regression and the function level certification are done uh, out here in California at the, uh, the, the, the joint center between IBM and, and SAP called ISIC. And then other sorts of certifications for new levels of SAP software, et cetera, are done uh, typically in Germany. So that's what the other stands for in this picture. And so they've done this certification for 501. And then, um, you know, the 502 stuff comes out, they do regression, and then they do certification. And then 503 comes out and they do regression. And then they've got this, this concept of what they, they view as like continuous regression um, being covered by IBM. So so IBM is doing you know, constant um, remigrations, starting from 500, running everything at 500, okay, migrating forward, making sure that everything still works at 501, making sure that everything works at 502. Um, and so it's a very much a similar stair step type thing, but, but it's occurring every day uh, back in, in, in Silicon Valley Lab to, to ensure that, that not only does the latest code work at the latest level, but all the function levels work with the latest code. And so that's what that that angle uh, uh, triangle is supposed to, to represent. There is that IBM is responsible for that in their minds. And then the other thing is is SAP has always been pretty aggressive. They they didn't really like supporting the star modes as an example. So they wanted you to go from say version eleven into version twelve M five hundred. They didn't want to support M one hundred. And and in, if you went from ten to eleven, they wanted you to go right to new function mode. And and most customers ignored that. They they did what they felt they needed to do, but SAP kind of didn't want to test and support the uh, the star modes and, and, and the new function or the compatibility modes. But they did come out here and they said, you know, basically they expect you to activate the uh, the maintenance and activation of the function level. But if you notice, it says function level equals maintenance level minus one or two. So even SAP has adopted that same methodology I talked about on the previous page, which is you, you apply maintenance as you've always applied maintenance, and then you activate function levels for stuff that is, is stable on your system for a while. Okay. And I just want to point out that, you know, they've been pretty aggressive. Uh, at, at, they've got a couple of SAP notes up there that talk about what they support and, and things like that. But they've been pretty aggressive if you look at dates in terms of making sure that, that um, as things come out, that they certify them fairly quickly and, um, you know, and if an Apple Compat change is changed, they, they make that certification done very quickly also. So um, just some information and, and show that they're, they're being, being a very aggressive vendor to make sure that customers can uh, exploit the new changes. And I will say that, you know, having been in DB2 for a long time and worked with these guys, and, and I was with DB2 through, uh, through I guess, uh, January 2020, um, you know, a lot of these changes were pushed through for SAP customers and customers like SAP who are using dynamic SQL and things like that. So, so obviously they, you know, as things are being delivered, they have an incentive to, to um, exploit them. So if you look at, uh, uh, if you're familiar with the, the, the phrase, um, imitation is the, the best form of a uh, flattery. Um, you know, uh, it, Broadcom started this effort to, to, to do something similar for continuous delivery before I started, but I, when they showed it to me, I'm like, oh, this is very similar. It, it's it's uh, pretty easy for me to under, understand this, but they've got a system here with a couple of LPARs um, and uh, a couple of data sharing groups, same three data sharing groups. The only difference is they have something called an X-Man group, and an X-Man group is just the, um, the communication mechanism that they use to communicate across LPARs and across uh, groups. So in this particular case, they've got two X-Man groups spanning those same three data sharing groups. And 
again, the maintenance here now is, is um, Broadcom maintenance, not DB2 maintenance, but you can see the maintenance rolls out in a similar way. And in this particular case, I, I've done the maintenance across uh, the data sharing group DG3A and X-Man group 2A and 2B. And at that point, um, you can basically do the work that requires a, what they call compare and binds and then activation of a new level set. And this can all be done online. So, so this is an online change, which is different. Previously, if you wanted to apply maintenance in, a, uh, in an X-Man group, you had to, you had to, to stop that X-Man group. And, and so now you do maintenance the same way you would do a DB2, which is one member at a time. And then again, similarly like in a DB2 data sharing group, once everything's at, at the same level, you can activate the, the, uh, the level set. And so this just shows you the same sort of capability here. So, um, so it should be fairly, uh, if, if you're a Broadcom customer, it should be fairly familiar to you and, and should, should be uh, actually you know, complimentary if you look at it, because now you don't have to take an outage on the X-Man group. And uh, just some, some terminology about a level set. A level set is slightly different from a Broadcom perspective. Um, the, the blue lines here, or the blue boxes or, or circles represent uh, just normal PTFs, and you can put those on as normal maintenance. But every so, once in a while, Broadcom products will issue um, a, a level set PTF, and that just prereqs the previous set of PTFs. And and then obviously the next level set prereqs the previous level set and all of the, the, the older uh, PTFs in between there. And what it is, is it's just an easy way for a customer to say, give me everything below this level. And it's also an easy way for when checking to make sure that, that all of the prereqs for any sort of functionality or, or fixes um, are applied before you activate something. And you know, similarly, um, if you look out here, the X-Man status is, is very similar to the, the DB2 display group. Um, it, it shows information about active, high as possible, et cetera and then the maintenance on the, the various systems. So you can see here, CA11 has got, uh, got, needs to come up in maintenance to do something. So, um, and it, right now it's inactive, so it doesn't matter, but if you wanted to activate it, it would have to be at, at a higher maintenance level. And then in a similar manner, again, I don't wanna to spend too much time on it, but they've got the concepts of, of displaying the level set, um, testing to see whether you could activate a level set and uh, act actually activating the level set. And so, uh, like I said, I, I was, uh, I'll, I'll use the word flattered a little bit because most of the, the stuff that we talked about from the DB2 side, I was the lead architect on and, and, and these guys looked at it and said, yeah, that makes sense. Let's do something similar. Okay, uh, final uh, comment here is just, uh, um, Broadcom is also being, you know, doing what they can to be uh, supportive of the changes. So you can see that, you know, M5, 10, I think, came out in June of last year. Um, it may have been May, but, but uh, or this year, sorry. Um, but uh, Broadcom certified it and, and said that they have toleration support, you know, within a month. Um, and, and Broadcom typically is doing uh, toleration support ASAP, and then they do exploitation support of the items um, as things, you know, uh, uh, are prioritized, et cetera. So, Okay, so let's talk about DB2 continuous delivery and what was delivered. Um, and, and again, gratuitous animation here, but, uh, but I thought it was cute. So a couple of things that I wanna talk about before we get started here. Um, so I'm gonna use the terminology function level. Uh, so 5XX to mean you know, a, a specific function level. Catalog level means you know, the, the catalog level at that level. Um, if I say something like like function level and, and don't mention a, a cat mate, I assume you've either applied it or there was no cat mate. Um, and in general, I'm not going to talk about the cat mates because from an operational perspective, um, they typically don't matter very much to customers. I mean, they, they matter trying to, to run the cat mate, but they don't typically affect the behavior of your systems, right? They're typically alter added of, of a column to a, a, a table. Um, and, and so from that aspect, they don't really have um, a lot of impact to your system. Um, there are a few things that I'm not gonna talk about, um, like uh, DB2ZAI, you know, there's a lot of changes in there. This, that's not a, this is not a presentation on DB2ZAI, uh, although like I said, I will mention the, the, the behavioral changes for start ML as an example that were added. Um, so just, just some basic information. 
Okay, so the very first thing that you had to do when you when you're on DBT 12 M500 and you were thinking about going to M501 is you had to look at this very complex set of stuff to deal with um, updating the data server drivers. And, uh, and in particular, you needed to do that if you wanted to adopt Apple Compat M501 and above for the data server drivers. And I'll just say that, that um, I was sort of responsible for this, but I was also convinced by the, the DDF team to do some of this. And, and in retrospect, it wasn't the smartest thing to do, but um, the, the decision was made to, to kind of force a change here. And, and part of it was something that I wanted, which was the ability for customers to specify the behavior at a package level, just like you could for every other package. So if you have a static package, either it's exposed to, to um, changes in Apple Compat or it's not based on the bind option. And if you look at the data server drivers, they're not, they're not the same because they're processing you know, the, the uh, dynamic SQL from ODBC and JDBC drivers, but that doesn't mean that you don't want the ability to seg segregate. And so um, I wanted the ability to have Apple Compat apply to these things. And I was convinced that um, by some folks that, that we also had to have this client Apple Compat, which I never liked. Um, but anyway, um, the client Apple Compat thing or requirement kind of went away with this PH0842. So you can kind of look at that if you want to want to get rid of that. Um, and then there's two schools of thought. And again, this is one of those things where you go out and talk to customers and, and either they like what you do or they hate what you do, but, but no, one's, no one feels like there's one answer to this. So some customers are very, um, I, I've done whatever I've done for the last couple of years, five years, 10 years, um, and, it, and it seems to have worked. And then, then you say, well, you know, do you have these, these um, ZParms, DDL underscore compatibility or DDF underscore compatibility applied? Oh yeah, I've got this one set and there's like six values for that ZFARM. I've got this value set and this value set. And, and then you say, well, do you realize the reason why those are there is because um, there was a change in behavior between say DB2 10 and 11 or nine and 10, and you had a problem. And so you put that in to, to, uh, to rectify that problem. But if you had Apple Compact Control, you would have never seen that problem or you could have created another set of, of uh, packages that didn't have those problems. Oh, that's interesting, but I still like to do it the way I want to do it. And if something fails, I'll fix it. Um, so I call that the Wild West, which is I just advance the thing. Things work or they don't. If they don't work, I can tell the developers, hey, do whatever you want. You know, if you can either fix your application or I'll give you a set of packages on a previous Apple Compat and your application will continue to work. Um, I think that's complete failure from a, an enterprise planning perspective because it says, I didn't do the testing. Um, I had a failure, which could have been an operational failure, which affected customers. Um, and, and my management team probably thinks that I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, so you can still use the, the I want to control things. I want to create a new set of uh, packages at each Apple Compat level as applicable, and, and then move applications that care about those things. Um, oh, sorry. Thank you. All right, <laughs> I turned off, turned off notifications, but apparently uh, not all of them. Okay, um, so, so the good news is you can have both at the same time. You can have a set of packages like the default null ID packages that, that you know, run at any Apple Compat you want or some old Apple Compat level. And you can apply and, and, and provide um, specific uh, Apple Compat levels for specific uh, uh, collection IDs. So I just suggest that if you uh, if you haven't done this yet, go out and read the two blogs. Um, I contributed in, in, in to the second one and, and, and edited the first one. Um, and uh, I'll just say that that I'm sorry for the complexity. <laughs> that's all I can, that's all I can do. <laughs> all right. So on to the things that really matter. Um, so SQL changes. So we had uh, an enhancement to list ag, and, and this was really the prototype for continuous delivery. This actually shipped into the code in, in summer of uh, 2016. And remember DD2 G8 in, in autumn or fall of, of 2016. And then this was activated uh, in, in spring of uh, maybe winter of 2017. 
But in the meantime, DB2 did all the work that they needed to do to, to, in order to make sure that this works. So they, they did the testing, they did the, um, the build process, they did the, the documentation. All of that stuff was done um, based on the fact that this code had been shipped but had not been activated yet. And so it's just a little function, it's called uh, list ag. And, it, and if you run it against the employee table, you can see in this particular case, you can see the, uh, the job descriptions. Um, and, and so A001 has clerk, uh, a couple of clerks, a president and sales rep. Um, and then if you look at something like D11, it's got you know, a bunch of designers and a manager and it's kind of annoying to see all those things. And so there's also a list ag with a distinct um, and you can see as an example, now you've got a designer and manager, which is a little, little cleaner if you were interested in that. So um, that was list ag and, and like I said, it's a nice little function, um, probably nothing earth shattering, but it, but it was the basis for all of the testing and all of the capability um, that was needed for, for further uh, enhancements. The next enhancement, again, was probably something that most people didn't pay too much attention to. If you're using Unicode and, and, and using Unicode UTF-16, this matters to you. And in particular, SAP uses Unicode six, uh, UTF-16. And in particular, what's going on here is that uh, you can't cast a number to a, a graphic uh, UTF-16 character string. And so that's just the additional enhancement here, which is now you can use graphic against uh, a, a UTF-16 string and cast it. The other thing that happened in, um, in, in 502, and this, in this particular case was um, function level 502 activated and then Apple Compat for your tooling that does DDL. And uh, what this is, is the ability to do uh, pervasive encryption from a DB2 perspective. So pervasive encryption from a DFSMS and RACF perspective is shipped in DB2.11. But if you had a particular table as an example that you wanted to use a specific key label for, um, or Stowe Group as an example, you want to use a key label for, uh, this change really lets you do that in, in a more granular level and lets the DBA do it, not necessarily the storage administrator. Um, so there was a couple of changes to, to tables, sys indexes, sys Stowe Group, sys tables, and sys table space. Um, and those have all key label columns in them. And you can see some things like uh, when you create a table and you create an index, the index inherits the key label from the table. So they're both encrypted using the same key label. You don't want a situation where the index is using a different key label and maybe Chris runs a query and can't decrypt um, from the index, but can decrypt from the table. So uh, that's why that's there. And then again, like I said, there's some changes to the DDL. And I'm there's a bunch of messages in here that'll say something similar for other, other pages, but I'm just gonna mention it once. So essentially, if you've done this work um, and you wanna you want exploit this, the thing that exploits it has to be M502. So if I'm using Spoofy to create my table, Spoofy has to be M502, okay? The thing is called pervasive encryption or transparent encryption, sometimes the DBC team called it. Um, it is transparent. Okay, so I can have uh, an Apple Compad V10R1 application select from the table. It's, it's not affecting that, that application. It's only the, the, the guy that's doing the, the um, create tables, an example, needs to be M502. Okay, M503, a uh, couple, couple quick changes here. So again, the, the new start, stop, and display ML commands for, um, for the machine learning DB2ZAI. And then um, there's a new cons uh, console message for activate function level. So some of you may have used a different console me message and I probably should have put it on the screen. But if you, if you had done a, a um, prior to applying the maintenance and activation of the function level, if you've done a, um, an activate function level, you might've seen a message on the machines that, that um, well, the machine that you did the, the activate on, you immediately saw a message that said the catalog DVD had been reloaded. But other machines you wouldn't see until that machine reloaded the catalog DVD. And there was some confusion by customers thinking that, that, um, that the function level activation was not going on across the system at the same time. And in fact, it was. It's just that the catalog DVD gets reloaded when the catalog or directory is referenced. So in, 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 a, in an idle system, as an example, it could take, in one, one customer case, it was uh, 30 minutes 
before that catalog DVD was reloaded. And so they were freaked out and thinking that there was some sort of problem with activate function. So now there's a new message and you'll see that happen simultaneously across the system. Another thing that happened in temporal auditing or in, in 503 was uh, temporal auditing. And this was a change in behavior. So temporal auditing added additional columns to the, to the history table that basically said who did something. So if I made a change in a base table, the temporal table would say, Chris made an update and here was the previous value. Uh, and you can have various things. I think there's about 14 different values that you can put in there, special registers, the accounting special registers. So this is things like the uh, TCPIP address of the, the client, the, uh, the accounting information, that sort of stuff can go in there. Um, the problem was that, that the way that Temporal works is it's a query rewrite by Optimizer. And it was filtering out records that had null in them from, um, from records that had previously existed in the table. So if you had a temporal table, you also added the temporal auditing columns. The previous uh, records all had null for those, those uh, fields because they didn't exist before, right? And, and so um, the optimizer was filtering those out. And so the, this change basically makes that, that, that those records not be filtered out. The problem is, is that that's an incompatible change from an SQL perspective. And so they wanted to do this change in such a way that the application could decide when it wants to see that change. So it's related to Apple Compat. And then uh, similarly with, with regards to, to temporal, um, if you want to have a um, replication of system period uh, re uh, temporal tables, um, you needed this ability to, to have uh, an insert with a value that was supposed to be generated by DB2. And so that is also being controlled by a new global variable. And in this case, that particular uh, replication software, so the, <clears throat> the, um, the application that's doing the inserts on the target system needs to be bound at, at, at uh, Apple Compat in 503 in order for that to work. Uh, 504, um, Notice this says made in, in England here, uh, but this, this is, um, I thought this was funny because it's compression and it's not a very good compression utility and it's not doing a very good job. And that's kind of what I feel was done here, which was a Z parm to enable Huffman compression. Um, and the, the, the documentation when I reviewed it said, well, what the customer can do is they can set the Z parm, it's online changeable, create their table and then change the Z parm back the other way. And I'm like, really? That's not very usable. No one will ever use that. <clears throat> um, but Huffman compression is, is a, a, an additional compression capability if you have a Z14 and above. And uh, is, is that becomes prevalent in your enterprise. I, I definitely think you should look at it because it does, uh, it does add a, an additional about 30% compression to your system. OK, so uh, 504 was, uh, was a, an item that, uh, that I, I spent a lot of time talking to customers about because they were concerned about the uh, um, the deprecation of things, which were already deprecated. This is just going to prevent you from creating them once you have an Apple Compat of 504. Um, and so the first one is synonyms. And so I've got amazing, astonishing, uh, awesome. Those are all synonyms. Um, the second one was segmented table spaces. And this is a, a segmented base. Uh, partition table spaces and hash table spaces. All of those things, if you have a tooling, um, spoopy, decent tep to uh, admin tool, uh, RC query, whatever that you're using from different product vendors. Those and those things are bound at 504. They by default will not be able to create those objects. Um, but you can use a simple thing of set current Apple compat application compatibility, B12, R1, and 503. Um, and then you can create all of the segmented table spaces you want. Um, it's this is really if you're familiar with the kind of uh, economists at all, this is nudge theory. Okay, it basically says, I'm going to let you do it, but I'm going to kind of remind you that maybe you don't want to do it. You don't want to create segmented table spaces anymore. You don't want to create hash table spaces anymore because they're not, they're not long term, right? Okay, uh, IDA pass through. So this is basically uh, the ability to run some, some functions that are part of DBT Blue that are not part of the DBT ZOS space if you have an IDA appliance. The first set of those things, cum dis, uh, first val, et cetera, I'll, I'll call it statistical type functions. And then the, uh, the second set are regular expression functions. And these, are, these actually operate in Unicode. 
Um, and if you've ever done uh, complex like, like predicate processing, that's what a regular expression is. Uh, Apple can have M504, a set of new, um, I call it syntactic sugar. So this is um, existing syntax, as you can see on the left, and new syntax that, that is also allowed. So, so additional synonyms, if you will. I hate to use the word synonyms, aliases. How about a different addition, additional syntax that's allowed for those, those particular items, <clears throat> just to make uh, porting of applications easier across multiple databases. Okay, M505, um, the first one is, is, again, if you have IDAA, is the, uh, the improvement um, to allow you uh, uh, HTAP, which is the, the migration or, or the, the combination of, of OLTP and, and, and OLAP. And what it does is it allows you to run, say, an o OLTP insert and then run an OLAP query on IDAA and actually see the value that you just inserted, just like you would if you ran everything on DB2. So that's interesting. Um, rebind phase in for packages. This is really an item that customers were complaining about. Uh, version 11 had what's called the break in, which allows better uh, capability for certain things like alters and rebinds. Um, but it still wasn't working in a lot of cases. And so, what, what's going on here is really they're just building an extra set of packages in the background, loading those packages, and letting new applications start on those, those, those packages while old applications finish up on the, the previous set of packages. So you, if you're a Kix guy, you can think of this as a Kix new. It's very similar. Um, RunStats page sampling, again, a change that was made to RunStats so that uh, they can do page sampling, but it, it only starts at, um, at function level 505. So you have to start that. And um, it, it basically is going to improve your sampling. And then uh, the something that's kind of probably below the radar for a lot of customers, but um, deck float indexes. So deck floats came out as a data type in version nine, but there was no index support for it. And so finally, you can create indexes on, on deck float tables, um, which I think is great. And again, only the application that creates the index needs to be M505. If I've got a, a V10R1 application that's been referencing deck float columns in a predicate for 10 years, um, I can rebind that afterwards and I can pick up the usage of that index and still leave that application at V10R1. Okay, it's just a, it's just the create and, and the alter that that, uh, that need to be done in, in M505. Uh, and then again, another enhancement to temporal, you'll see temporal over and over again here. Um, and this is the ability to uh, have temporal uh, referenced in triggers. So some information there. Okay, uh, encrypt the data key and decrypt data key. So way back when, I don't remember when, version eight or nine, there was the encrypt TDES and decrypt TDES. And, and they were they were terrible functions in the sense that they did do encryption, but they forced the application to provide the key. And there, there was a couple ways to deal with that. There was a special register that you could use and there was, a, um, I'm trying to think what else, but, but it wasn't really very usable. The key management is always one of the hardest things uh, to do with, with encryption. Um, so now we have these encrypt uh, data key and decrypt de data key uh, functions, and they use the key labels. So, so again, now the, the key management is part of RACF, as an example, or, or top secret. Um, the, the one thing that I still think makes this pretty unattractive is the size of the column. So I've, I'm creating my, uh, my table, my name column is, is 20, and my phone number, which typically would be 11 bytes here in the U.S., is a, is a var binary 95. Um, so, uh, you know, let's just use 8x the size. Um, that, that to me is not very attractive and, and it makes the, the function kind of uh, not very attractive. Um, from a usability perspective, I say, you know, I, I'm going to insert Chris and I'm going to say encrypt data key and I'm going to provide the phone number, um, 8675309. Uh, that's, that's the Tommy Two Tone Jenny Jenny song. Um, and then I'm going to provide my key label and I'm going to provide the, the type of, uh, of encryption that I want to occur. And um, I'm going to, uh, to then select it back and notice that I don't need to provide the key label or the, or the encryption type. And, and that's because the key label is one of those, those things that's in that 95 bytes. Um, and the theory is, is that, that if you can select from the table and decrypt it because you have authorization to the key label, why do you need to provide the key label? So 
The other thing is interesting is that if Colin had a record where he encrypted with his key label and I had a record where I encrypted with my key label, you essentially can have row by row uh, encryption with different key labels. Um, so th that may be interesting to some people if, they, if they're doing point queries and, and they know that I'm not going to try to decrypt Colin's uh, um, value because uh, I would get an error. I don't have, I don't have his key label, right? Um, so something to think about. And then you can look at news from the blog. And uh, I will say that the, the, uh, the ID writer for, from DB2 that helped me with that, that um, edited out 8675309. She was a, a, a Gen Z person, I guess, or something, and didn't know the meaning of that and put in 555. <laughs> so I thought that was funny when she did that. <laughs> OK, uh, 506. So this is a, another SAP item. And essentially what it's doing is if you're at Apple Compat 506 and you do a drop of an explicitly created uh, uh, table and table space, so you do a drop table, the table space will be dropped. And this always occurred for implicitly created uh, table spaces, but it did not occur for explicitly created table spaces. And so it left this kind of um, jagged edge here where if you had a combination of, of uh, implicitly and explicitly created table spaces, you know, drop had to be sensitive to whether it needed to drop the table or the table space. And this kind of cleans that all up and makes it consistent. Um, whether it's consistent in a way that everybody likes is another story, but it is consistent now. Um, and I will say that, that uh, there's, there's a, again, the drop has to be Apple Compat in 506, so in Spoopy or whatever. Um, but there is a reorg aspect to this, and that, that's reorg removing um, empty partitions. Um, and that will start taking effect as, as soon as you're at function level 506. So, so think about that if, you, uh, if you're going to 506. Some additional uh, syntactic sugar. So these are things that existed before. So the hash functions um, now, you know, there was a hash underscore MD5, there's a hash underscore SHA1. Now you can use the LUW syntax for hash. Um, you can use POW instead of power, et cetera. So these are just, again, family compatibility items. Uh, stats profiles. So in, in version 12, you're, you're aware that you know um, IBM brought back together stats and stats profiles, and they they would fill in, you know, what the optimizer thought you should have, um, and then they made this suggestion that was kind of funny that said, well, hey, um, if you've got old stats profile stuff out there, you probably want to remove it because you know maybe you created something with a histogram in in you know 1998 or whatever. Um, but but the optimizer is never using it used it but you're paying for it right you know and every time you run, run stats so that was like up to you to figure out what needed to be removed and also to take the chance right I remove it and then um, I have to rebind everything to figure out what I what the optimizer wants and then I have to throw away that rebind because um, I, I don't want to actually use it because I don't have any stats then I have to run run stats and then I have to go back and uh, and, 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 you know, uh, rebind again to get access pass. So it's kind of a messy process. And so this is an attempt to, to help you with that by um, having the DB2 figure out what stuff is needed and what stuff can be removed out of the profiles. Okay, NumLock US and NumLock TS. Uh, I've looked at a lot of customer systems over, over the years and, and some customers have, uh, you know, NumLock US and NumLock TS set to default and every once in a while, you find a customer who's got NumLock US and NumLock TS set to some egregious value, you know, 500,000. And you, you, you say, well, really, do you want every application in your environment to get 500,000 locks? And they're like, no, no, I don't want that. I really just want um, this one bad application to run, right? I bought it. It, it, it just gets thousands of locks or it's a batch job or something. Um, but the only way I can do that is with changing the ZParm. And even some customers I know will turn the ZParm on like, you know, three o'clock in the morning, change the value, run the batch job, turn the ZParm back to normal. Because obviously you don't want everyone getting 500,000 locks. Um, so now you can control these with, a, uh, with, with um, global variables. So that's good. As a DBA, you know, the, the nice thing about a global variable is you can grant access to it. So you can say, oh, a, a Colin can, can um, change this value of the global variable with a grant. Um, the thing you can't do is you can't control what Colin sets the value to, uh, which I did not like because um, although I might 
trust somebody to do it because their application needs it. I don't necessarily know that if the application changes and they need more locks, that they'll come and tell me that they need more locks. They might just change it without me knowing. So I suggest that you actually put this behind a stored procedure um, and, as a DBA and then grant execute on the stored procedure to the people who need to change the, the values. And then within the logic of the stored procedure, you can figure out the application or the user ID or whatever and set the value for that application. Because um, I just don't think that you want to let people go wild with, with locks. But that's just me. Uh, some more IDA pass through. The most interesting thing here probably are the regression functions. So these are the linear regression functions that LUW has, the uh, the reg X, uh, a reg R, and, and um, add, add and count, et cetera. Um, and I know a number of customers who are interested in those. So take a look at that. Uh, create or replace is, is kind of borderline uh, um, SQL, but it, but it certainly falls into uh, something that's interesting to people. And this is the ability to um, create or replace uh, a procedure. So normally, if you have SQL PL procedures and you have procedure A called procedure B, if you want to drop and recreate A, you have to drop B first, and that's a hassle. Now, with this change, you can actually create or replace A. Um, as long as it has it meets certain requirements, that's okay. If you like remove the call to B or something like that, that's a problem because of a uh, the dependency management issues. But as long as the dependencies remain the same, you can do that. So uh, that's, a, that's a nice feature for, for DBAs and for application programmers. Um, FTB support for non-unique indexes. Um, FTBs have had a storied uh, history in, in, in DB212 or, or, or five years plus after GA. And um, I'll say that they're probably marginally stable. Um, based on, on what I'm, I'm hearing from customers and, you know, and people like John Campbell even. So um, that said, this is an, another opportunity to use FTBs. And, uh, and, and so um, you know, at some point, I think that, that they will be useful. Certainly, I think you probably don't want to go to the point where you're using FTBs across the board. You probably want to control it for those applications that probably have, are mostly read as an example. That's where you're going to get the best benefit. And most of the issues have tended to be with applications that are doing reads, writes, and, and the, F, the FTB is going in and out of status because um, as you make writes to it and page splits, you know, it's kind of fighting what, what DB2 is trying to do with caching. And so you end up refreshing caches and things. And those, those tend to be the, the complexities that it's had. So certainly more stable indexes are probably better. And you can use the selected option here to, uh, and, and then the, the table to, to, to help you with that space. So something to think about. Uh, Multi-segmented to, to PBG. Um, so this is just uh, in, in M504, there was the ability to stop creating segmented table spaces. This is really the follow on to that, which is, okay, we know you got them. Um, you can create a set of table spaces and um, or alter, and, and then you can um, uh, reorg those, uh, those things from the multi-table segments out into to PBGs. Okay, so this is kind of a two-step process. And uh, again, you know, you need to have the, the Apple Compat behavior for the tooling that's doing the, uh, the alters and the moves. And then you're going to need the, uh, the, the reorg, which is a function level oriented thing. Okay, 509, the last, uh, the last one that really had, it, had anything of interest. Um, so tamper-proof audit policies, these are really the ability to turn on auditing and then make it how many use were difficult to turn it off, okay? Um, high availability accelerator tables. So this is the ability to have multiple tables and load balance across those tables, across multiple IDAs, IDAA systems. Um, Huffman compression, which was M502, 504? Anyway, um, Huffman com compression at the object level. So this is the way that Huffman compression should have been done. Um, and, and I'm glad to see that, that uh, now you can do it at, at the object level. And then a yet another temporal item, in this case, temporal RI, um, you can actually update or delete parent, the parents as long as you're not orphaning any rows in the children. So um, that's, a, that's a nice feature too for if you're using temporal. And finally, 510, and uh, I, I struggled. Did it change everything or did it change nothing? And in fact, uh, really all it is is just a staging ground to ensure that you've applied all of the previous function levels and you're ready for DD2 Apollo. Um, and they've done something similar in Apollo where 
Um, you go to M100, you go to M500, and then in order to go to M501, that's where the cat main occurs, right? But but remember, um, M500, you can you can once you're there, you can no longer fall back to DB2 version 12. So by doing it that way, they've made the migration to Apollo simpler for themselves and for you, right? You don't have to worry about coexistence of catalog tables and, and functionality and things like that. So um, that's kind of interesting and useful. And then uh, this is a, a linked, uh, so the, the slides are out there. Um, you can pull them, but this is a linked thing that talks about all the stuff that DB2 shipped that wasn't, um, wasn't part of a function level. And, uh, and what I did is I ran, took the section of the, the publications that that's in and I ran a word cloud on it. And you can see that uh, there's a lot of utility stuff. Uh, so there's loads and the word utilities and um, you know various other things, install related changes and things like that that were out there that were not part of function levels. So um, I, I encourage you to go out and take a look at that because there's, there's nuggets of good things out there. There's uh, um, something similar to the rebind phase in that, that helps with, uh, um, locking and dynamic SQL issues that, that went out. And, and again, it didn't require any sort of function level. It was just a, a, an improvement in an out, internal algorithm. So those things I, I think you should really take a look at. And uh, so let's jump on to the results here. So I, I think if you look at, at what's been delivered, I think you see that DBT has been able to deliver more enhancements than they have in, in a typical release. And, and some of those enhancements have been um, risky, certainly the, the ability to change the catalog, um, you know, is, is something that enables more capability to be put out um, than, than in previous releases. Um, Apple Compact continues to provide a, a, a capability for the DBAs to control exposure um, to incompatible changes or, or changes in behavior. Um, and, and I still think that, you know, customers are still on the fence on it. There, there's, there's goodness and badness in anything, right? It, it is extra work for you to manage your system in, in this environment. Um, but, you know, they're going to go basically five and a half years without a migration to a new release, at least, um, which, which provides you a degree of stability that, that um, normally you would have maybe had to go through two releases in that time period, right? A, a 13 and, and maybe 14 would be on, on deck right now. So um, I, I think that that's a, that's a positive. And with that, I want to thank you. And I wanted to say, uh, make sure that you fill out your, uh, your feedback. And the, the QR code can help you with that. And of course, we'd like to encourage you to become a member. And uh, finally, um, I guess we'll talk about questions. All right, thanks very much then, Chris. That's brilliant. Um, loads of information in there. I've got several pages of notes and I'm sure I'll go through the falls again as well later. Um, right, have we got any questions? I can't see any at the moment. If anybody wants to do it, verbally, then please raise a hand. Everybody's quiet. <laughs> I've got any questions, I'm afraid, Chris. I want to go for their coffee, right? You still get coffee, right? In, in virtual conferences, isn't there coffee? Uh, uh, of some form, I guess, yeah. Yeah, there's <laughs> a coffee break till, um, till five, yeah. All right, well, I'm looking forward to happy hour. <laughs> <laughs> No, no questions. Okay, well, thanks very much indeed, then, Chris. That's I wanna, really good. I want to thank that. everybody for spending the, the time with me. Take care. Stay safe. Okay, guys, that's it for DB2 and GSC this year. Uh, there's more sessions to come. If you want to join any others, uh, have a look out. And um, please fill in your feedback forms. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks very much, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.